As for Spain, after 20 years of wars and discord, where is she now? She is agitated by the convulsions of the most barbarous reprisals. She struggles in blood and tears to obtain that which the Convention of Bayonne assured her. Whatever might have been the means employed on another account to unite her, the equality of civil rights, the reform of the convents, the suppression of the Inquisition, our civil code, our admirable administrative system, our liberal institutions, our public instruction, all that Spain still seeks. All was in the laws of Bayonne. All was guaranteed by the accepted king, acknowledged by the convention, by a just king, enlightened, and a philosopher. I have seen many Spanish statesmen in my sad travels far from my country, and how many have I heard bitterly deplore that the throne of the King Joseph had not been consolidated. Nothing without doubt can justify violence. Liberty itself, nothing without doubt can justify violence. But at the point of a foreign sword, it would become very hateful. But after all, the torrent of invasion would have retired, and the fertile earth, deposed by its waves, would have rendered the peninsula fruitful since 20 years. Poland, could it be, constituted when Austria and Prussia in arms were at the head of our allies? Moreover, that nation whom all generous men bear in their heart. Did she, during the Russian campaign, do all that she could have done to hasten the hour of her independence? Has she not had in her own bosom partisans of Alexander? Did Poland in fine demonstrate that intense degree of universal energy, that wonderful enthusiasm displayed by Spain and Russia? Yeah, no kidding. The Emperor Napoleon in the Second Polish War, ought he have done more? Could he do more without imprudence? If he had done it, would they not have accused him with having provoked like a madman in the middle of a mortal crisis the defection of Vienna and Berlin? Italy, the Pope, Napoleon himself expressed his tardive regrets. He was very far from believing himself to be perfect. Have we not heard him at Paris talk of his limited faculties, the wisest? of the ancients said, I know that I know nothing. The greatest of moderns said, do you believe me to be more than a man? It is the same cry, precious emanation of the same soul, although uttered by two men at 2,000 years of distance. Before this avowal was so ingenuously sublime of human imperfection, how wretched is the pride of those state sophists whose superb theory without Ceasing to think itself infallible terminates with the most sad results? No, the emperor was not, did not believe himself to be above the confusion, the errors of humanity, and yet none ever abused less in absolute power. None had a more prodigious genius than he. None ever accomplished such vast deeds in so short a space of time. None above all ever better loved his country. As or the reproaches of despotism and usurpation, France and its government have made the most glorious of answers. In answer, without reply, they have inaugurated the statue of the emperor. His detractors do not see how far their accusations are contradicted by public opinion. Let them endeavor to explain to us, to explain to themselves, how a great nation without it was senseless, could have raised a triumphant monument to a despot, to a usurper, 15 years after his death? Is it that France does not confound, like them, a popular dictature with despotism? It is because France knows too well her rights to be ignorant that the temporary consul, the consul for life, the emperor named three times by the universal voting, was the most legitimate chief of all times and all countries. Can they think that since the inauguration of the imperial statue, the opinion of France has changed? But the representative chamber has just confirmed that opinion by her last vote. Would it reclaim from the other end of the world the ashes of a despot, of a usurper, 15 years after his death? It is true that they still persist in prescribing the family of the hero whose remains they claim. 
may the vote at least not be disdained, and that which it possesses a favorable. May its prompt accomplishment console us in our exile, where the winds of France sometimes bring us some accents of sympathy. General Pillay, the worthy historian of the campaigns of Napoleon, has refuted the reproach of an immeasurable ambition. Monsieur de Gobery has signalized amidst the petitioners who have not forgotten us, the illustrious names of Messina, of Lan, of Ney. That recalls so many victories. Monsieur de Brecqueville has declared that it was not the emperor who betrayed the country in the Hundred Days. Monsieur Magouin has celebrated the hero of national independence whose wandering family is a living trophy of our disasters. General Larrabee nobly replied to those who have the courage to affirm that there are no more prescribed. So many eloquent voices, the wishes of the citizens of Paris, of Toulouse, of La Chiron, those great names, dear to France, will all be powerless to repay injustice. Let us leave to the country the care of our return. When she desires it, her will will be expressed in a suitable manner. Paris, Toulouse, and La Chiron will find echoes in every part where the memory of Napoleon is honored. The names of Moscova, of Montebello, of Esslings are not the only illustrious names of the ancient companions, the friends of Napoleon, and the government which has already repaired in part the iniquity, will abase without difficulty the odious barrier out of which they keep citizens prescribed upon account of their name, and who will never cease till their last sigh to stretch out their arms towards their country. In terminating this first volume and in returning to our political views of 1800, I ask myself what influenced the experience of so many years has had upon our sentiments of that epoch has not experience modified the opinions of C.S.? Have those opinions remained stationary? Or on the other hand, returning to the ancient recollections of the constituent assembly, have they passed from our constant republic to the constitutional monarchy? The authentic memoirs of that venerable man can alone resolve that question. I hope and trust that he will not deprive the country of his last thoughts. As for myself, my regrets for the senatorial republic have remained a very long time. Adversity, which is not very good for softening the humor, has struggled in my mind for a long time against the evidence of the universal voting in favor of the monarchy and against my conviction of the genius and patriotism of Napoleon. In fine, although in my conference at Mantua with my brother... My refusal had no other motive than the political restrictions to which I did not think proper to submit, but it is not less true that until my residence in England, there still remained in me a great deal of the old Republican, and public liberty appeared to me to be almost incompatible with royalty.